Okay, I think we can start. So hi everyone, thank you for being here today. Uh, so my name is uh, Hélène, I'm CTP's Capital Market and Policy Officer. Uh, I'm working very closely with investors to help them navigate the EU sustainable finance uh, policy landscape. So working a lot um, on SFDR, taxonomy, CSRD, and thinking about how CTP can best uh, help investors through data and engagement. Um, I also represent CDP in the EU platform on sustainable finance, where we focus on the usability of data in the framework, which is very topical for this webinar. Uh, today, I'm here with Jérôme uh, Tarasca, which is a senior account manager at CDP, uh, which some of you in the call might know. Uh, Jérôme and I have been leading a campaign this year called the Green Finance Accelerator was a sort of pilot where we worked with European investors uh, to engage companies on topics related to adverse impacts and the EU taxonomy and try to maximize the quality and, and quantity of corporate disclosures on those data points. After the end of the disclosure cycle of CDP in October, uh, we shared with those investors a structured data set that aggregated all those indicators. And this is the basis of what we will present today in terms of data insights. Um, so you're welcome to submit your questions in the chat uh, at any time. We will have time for Q&A at the end and we will share the recording of the event and the, and the slides after. In terms of agenda, so um, we'll just give a brief reminder of the context, uh, then we'll dive straight away into data insights. Uh, in terms of disclosures uh, and actual analysis of what has been reported for specific indicators. Uh, and then we'll move on to an illustrative case where we'll look at a hypothetical equity portfolio and how you can use CDP data to analyze potential and, and actual impact and use cases of, of CDP data. And then Jerome will, uh, will give you a showcase of what the data set looks like uh, and then we'll have some time uh, hopefully for, for Q&As. So this is just a bit of a reminder of the context and, and why we're doing this. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this call is aware that a lot has, uh, has happened in terms of sustainable finance policy in the EU between SFDR, the taxonomy, which created um, large data gaps and large data needs for investors. Um, so around, the, of course, the, the climate change objectives, but also around the environmental objectives. Uh, the adverse impacts that sometimes were difficult to collect for investors, uh, the EU taxonomy. Um, and the timeline at the bottom of this slide basically highlights that uh, while investors needed a lot of this data now, um, there was a, basically a timeline gap in terms of what we could expect companies to disclose. Uh, we're starting to have numbers coming through uh, in terms of taxonomy uh, KPIs with the first companies that have uh, disclosed taxonomy alignment this year. Um, we're going to see uh, disclosure of, of adverse impact indicators coming through with CSRD disclosures, but it's not going to be until 2025. Um, and even when this all works out, there's still a large coverage gap for investors that have international exposures uh, and where companies might not even fall in the scope of those regulations. So this is really where CDP comes in. So basically what we've done is try to maximize our coverage of adverse impact indicators, um, which all companies disclosing globally to, to CDP can see when they answer to us. Um, and this year, we have really focused on the indicators that we think was uh, quite hard for the market to access and had very low coverage. So the ones I'm thinking about is not to be the one on biodiversity. So the fact that the companies has uh, activities uh, in biodiversity sensitive areas that can negatively impact those areas. And another one that is uh, around uh, water discharge quality uh, emissions to water. But this table is really a snapshot of the mapping that we did uh, of adverse impact indicators in CDP's questionnaire. And you can see that there's actually quite a lot of them that we collected already for, for a while. Another uh, set of uh, questions that we've introduced this year uh, is basically to collect information on the EU taxonomy KPIs uh, and more broadly on sustainable finance taxonomies. 
Um, something quite important to note is that um, EU taxonomic APIs is now public information uh, disclosed by companies under the scope of uh, in their official reports. Uh, so our purpose wasn't to collect exactly the same information, but, but rather to try to put it in context. So what we've done at CDP is basically to put the EU taxonomic APIs and disclosures in the context of transition plans. Uh, so we integrated that question and our transition planning question, uh, where we ask companies to identify revenues and spending aligned with climate transition plans, and then they can they can use a sustainable finance taxonomy as one methodology to to make that assessment. Um, and what was interesting is that there are companies who disclose taxonomic APIs in official reports that also disclose to CDP. Uh, but have not necessarily made that link with uh, with their transition plans. But we'll go into a bit more details uh, on that later. There's, of course, a huge amount of information related to the EU taxonomy, eligibility alignment, poor economic activity, etc. Uh, so you could create a, a data set on its own. Uh, but what we did is essentially to, to aggregate and summarize this information uh, for each company so that uh, we can basically have uh, one one KPI per company that is easily uh, usable for our stakeholders. Uh, another element that I think is important to note is that um, we basically we are also asking companies two things that are not necessarily uh, present in official disclosures. Uh, so when a company has uh, eligible but non-aligned activities in official reports, they do not have to explicitly say if they are not aligned because they failed the substantial contribution criteria or if they failed the do no significant harm criteria. And that's something that we do ask uh, as part of uh, CDP disclosures. Now going to the data part of the presentation. So uh, in 2023, we had over 23,000 companies disclosing to CDP. Uh, so it's a substantial increase uh, through time, as you can see on this uh, on this slide. Um, if you focus on the 2023 disclosures, uh, you can al also see that we had approximately 5,000 companies that disclosed on water, uh, approximately 5,000 companies on biodiversity module that we've introduced uh, this year and around 3,000 companies on the plastic module that we've introduced this year that I'm not going to be focusing on so much in, in this webinar. Uh, and finally, around 1,000 companies on forest. Uh, now, something important to note is that those lower numbers for uh, water, for example, or forest, are also due to the fact that our samples, uh, the number of companies that CDP ask uh, to disclose on those topics is smaller than for climate. So uh, the disclosure rate is not necessarily substantially lower than than for climate. Now, if we go to the actual list of adverse impact indicators and the disclosures that we got, uh, I'm not going to go into the number by number for, for the indicators, but uh, basically just to give you an overview. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see the adverse impact indicators related to climate, uh, where there's a, a quite a high coverage. So, for example, the uh, the indicators that show the highest highest sort of numbers of disclosure, for example, are scope one emissions, carbon reduction initiatives, where we had over 20,000 companies answering to, to that question for scope one, uh, over 17,000 companies. And the lowest uh, coverage, I would say, is for scope three, where we had uh, around 9,000 companies disclosing uh, an energy production where uh, around 4,000 companies disclosed. For water, so putting it also in the context of this lower sample, uh, here you have the water policy indicator where you had the, the highest level of disclosures. Um, and uh, yes. So, sorry to interrupt you. Um, it seems like some people can't see the slide. Would you mind trying to share ah, again? Yeah. OK, yeah, absolutely. Stop sharing. And Romeo and Benedict, it would of... be great if you let us know after the fact, because um, we could see them on our side. But uh... yeah, I will try to share again.
Can you see them now? Romeo, Benedict. Mm. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good. No worries. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so uh, for water, we had uh, also quite a, a high um, high number of disclosures on the adverse impact uh, indicators, so notably water policy, uh, water source from area of stress, and the lowest uh, disclosure number was basically for the emissions to water indicator. Um, and on the right hand side of this slide, so you see the, the more biodiversity forest related indicators, so um, the negative impact of activities located uh, in biodiversity sensitive areas where we had around a thousand companies giving details on that uh, and around um, 800 companies on forest related policies. Now what I'd like to, to kind of emphasize here is that we also get a lot of additional insights that are not exactly related to the specific question where a company can report, for example, on their energy production. So in other words, in CDP questionnaire, there are other questions where a company can indicate uh, elements that can explain why they haven't disclosed on a specific you know, quantity or quantifiable indicator. So in the energy production example, for example, there are 13,000 companies um, that disclose that they are not uh, producing energy, which is understandable then kind of putting that back into context that you have a lower number of companies who are uh, disclosing on energy production. And the other example I like to give is for the, the water related metrics. Um, so we are asking companies, for example, if they are monitoring a specific aspects of uh, water risk, so water consumption, withdrawal, water quality, and they can basically answer to us that they are not monitoring this water aspect, for example, or that this water um, aspect is not relevant for them. Uh, and I think it's a particularly interesting insight, specifically in the context of ESRS, uh, where um, it's an interesting preview of materiality assessment where a company has been assessed as material for water by CDP, but on a specific indicator, they say that this indicator is not relevant to them. Uh, similarly, for the, the biodiversity adverse impact indicators, we have around a thousand companies that did say that they had uh, activities in or near biodiversity sensitive areas and disclosed details. But we also previously asked them, do you even have activities in those areas? And here we had uh, around 11,000 companies that answered. So 6,000 said that they don't have activities in or near biodiversity sensitive areas. 4,000 said they did not assess it. And then approximately 1,000 said yes. So now I'd like to zoom in a little bit on selected indicators. We're not going to go over all the adverse impact indicators, but this is just an emphasis on specifically the new ones that we've introduced and some that I think are, are particularly important. Uh, but so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on uh, the one related to biodiversity. Uh, it's quite an important one uh, that we know has been difficult to get uh, and estimate for investors. Uh, so, as I mentioned, first we ask companies if they have any activities in or near biodiversity sensitive areas. So, I've already highlighted the, the answers. So, approximately 1,200 said yes. Um, and I wanted to give an element of comparison looking at, you know, um, market cap benchmark like Acqui or Eurostox. And you can see a breakdown of answers on the right hand side per number of companies and on the left hand side in terms of market cap. And that gives a slightly different picture. Uh, so, for example, looking at the number of companies of Acqui, there's a bit of an equal split between the number of companies who haven't assessed it or said no. But when you look at market cap, for example, it's a much larger representation that did not assess it. For Eurostox, it's a bit of a different uh, insight. There's a slightly even split in terms of number of companies, but then if you look at um, at the market cap weighted answer, then you have uh, a larger representation of the companies that did say, yes, they have activities located in biodiversity sensitive areas. 
So for those companies that said yes, we asked to provide details. Uh, and basically, they can disclose as many sites as they want. So like I said, we had over a thousand companies, but looking at the number of sites that were disclosed, we had 2,000, over 2,800 sites that were disclosed and some companies report over 60 uh, sites. Um, and if we focus on the sort of country breakdown on the left-hand side of the, the screen, you can see a large uh, overwhelming representation of EU companies in there uh, and a bit on North America. Uh, so both in terms of number of companies and as well in terms of number of uh, of sites disclosed. Uh, I personally don't think it's because European companies have more activities in those area particularly, um, but the assumption is that it's closely related to the fact European companies will have to disclose this type of information under the, the upcoming CSRD and ESRS as it is a um, a specific data point that is in uh, ESRS, so they might have started to prepare for it and assess it. Um, on the right hand side, you can see a similar uh, split, but per sector this time. Uh, so we can see that basically companies in manufacturing, materials, infrastructure are those that have the most activities in biodiversity sensitive areas. Um, with, I think, an interesting data point for fossil fuel that has less than 65 companies, but over 300 sites. So it's like one of the largest ratio comparing the companies that said yes and the number of sites that they, that they disclose. Um, so we basically ask companies to give detailed information about those sites. Um, so one of them is the most important for the principal adverse impact indicators is that we ask them if um, the site can negatively affect the area and if mitigation measures have been implemented. Uh, so we had, for example, over 1,500 sites that were reported to negatively affect the area but mitigation measures have been implemented. And we had over 100 sites where they said they were negatively affecting the area, but no mitigation measures have been implemented. We also ask about proximity to the site. Uh, you can see clearly on the left-hand side that uh, most companies report on overlapping or adjacent uh, sites. Or, and as the proximity or the distance uh, gets further away, there's less and less disclosures, which is also an important thing to, to have in mind because actually for some economic activities, the negative impact on biodiversity sensitive areas can really um, uh, be felt uh, more than 70 kilometers away, I'm thinking. Uh, for example, about mining uh, activities. Um, finally, it's my last slide on biodiversity sensitive areas, but in terms of actions taken, which is an important part of the story. Um, so we ask about mitigation measures, uh, what type of mitigation measures have been implemented. Um, and something that I found was interesting in analyzing this data is that on the left hand side of the, the, the slide, there's about 400 sites for which mitigation measures um, basically uh, is biodiversity offset, which I think is is interesting, um, interesting thing to note. Um, and on the right hand side of the on the slide, you can see that for those who have negative impacts but are not implementing mitigation measures, what are the most represented economic activities? And I thought, interestingly, it was a lot of hotels, um, chemicals, and then cement, uh, and then a lower lower share uh, of other activities. So now moving on to uh, another uh, quite interesting indicator, which is emissions to water. Um, so this one is also something we've uh, considered to be quite difficult to, to assess in general by the market. Uh, some companies have to report under uh, pollutant sort of regulation in the EU for certain facilities, but not necessarily in this aggregated company, company level way in metric tons uh, of pollutants per pollutant. So we actually had around 900 companies that provided quantified uh, sort of numbers and metric tons of, of emissions to water. But as I was saying earlier, we also get a lot of information from other questions. Um, so basically, we had um, nearly 5,000 companies that reported on whether they are monitoring uh, their emissions to water. And we had, for example, 
a thousand companies that say they do not monitor it, a uh, thousand three hundred companies that said it wasn't relevant for them. And another interesting insight is that for those who do re uh, report it to monitor it, there was around 1,600 companies, and yet they didn't necessarily give quantified metrics of uh, uh, of emissions to water in, in ton. Um, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a snapshot of the data. Uh, as it's the case for many negative impact indicators, including scope, one to three emissions, you can see a large queue of the distribution. So the first 10 companies represent around 85% of total emissions to water of the sample. Um, so on average, you have companies in the sample that emit uh, you know, 37,000 tons of emissions to water per year, but for, for some companies, it's million. Uh, so basically, it's another sort of way to say that the dispersion in the data is very large uh, and that average are not necessarily going to give you fair representation of what other companies might uh, might look like, even if they operate in similar industries or economic activities. And what you can see at the bottom of the slide is basically uh, which economic activities represent the largest share of this impact in our sample. Uh, so you have a lot of chemicals, you have metals, uh, paper products, and uh, fertilizers. Uh, and finally, I'd like to talk about another indicator that um, we already collected in the past, but I think is a, is a very important one, uh, is water sourced from areas uh, of stress. Uh, so around 40% of companies that disclose water consumption volumes um, report sourcing water from areas of stress. Um, and out of those approximately 1,500 companies, you have over 300 uh, that disclose that more than 50% of their water is sourced from areas of stress. So you can see the chart uh, showing you that breakdown uh, and, and that if you look at the one in the middle, you have the range basically of what share of their water uh, is sourced from areas of stress. And if you focus on the ones that are 100% or over 50%, it represents quite a, a large uh, share of the sample. And then finally, on the right hand side, more on the action and policy side, you can see the breakdown um, of those companies in terms of whether they have a water policy. Uh, so a thousand companies have a water policy that is publicly available, but there's uh, a lot of companies that do not um, do not necessarily plan to develop one um, and or have one, but is not publicly available. So the public cannot judge whether they're actually putting uh, something in place to address this. So now I'll go over some uh, insights from new taxonomy disclosures in 2023. So I just like to, to um, restate what I said at the beginning of the presentation. What we do at CDP is really to ask uh, to companies to disclose on new taxonomy KPIs in the context of, uh, of uh, transition planning. So we basically ask companies if they identify spending and revenues that is aligned with their organization's climate transition. Um, so we had over 10,000 companies that answered to this question. Uh, our goal was whether to really to uh, to basically help assess the credibility of transition plans through the taxonomy. Uh, and we had over 75% of those uh, 10,000 companies that say they do not identify revenues and spending in line with their climate transition. Uh, but we had over 1,000 companies that do and use a sustainable finance taxonomy to do that. Uh, and out of those thousand, uh, around 700 specifically reported uh, that they were using the EU taxonomy and so disclosed the, the associated uh, KPIs. So this is a bit of a very simple uh, descriptive statistics of, of taxonomy alignment numbers uh, that you can see on the chart. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on that because we just published a huge report that is going into a lot of details into this analysis that I really encourage everyone to read. So we published with our partner Clarity AI uh, a report uh, basically exploring the EU taxonomy as a tool for transition planning. And we go into a lot of details into the, the, the uh, reported numbers of eligibility alignment per sector, per country, etc. But maybe some, some key insights that is in line with other studies out there is that 
certain um, sectors obviously have much higher uh, coverage of their economic activities in the taxonomy. Uh, so, you know, the, the power generation, infrastructure, manufacturing, um, and uh, and that in general you see a much higher um, uh, you see a much higher uh, amount of alignment for capital expenditure than for uh, for um, revenues. This is another way to visualize that. So you can see basically that a lot of the points of, are kind of gathered on the top left hand side of the of the chart, which means that companies tend to have much higher capex alignment and alignment in revenues. Uh, and, and the opposite is much more rare. So it's much more rare to see a company having higher a percentage of revenue alignment uh, compared to, to, to CapEx. And of course, there are some industries for which uh, you see just in general higher a degree of alignment, uh, because partly because their economic activities are also more covered uh, than for others. So this is some examples I'd like to give, uh, maybe not focusing so much on the numbers, but rather on the bottom part of the slide. So I like to look at uh, which were the economic activities most mentioned when the companies reported on taxonomy alignment. So here there's a little zoom in into the uh, power generation and, and fossil fuel um, sectors. Uh, and basically you can see that the most reported economic activity was electricity generation from wind power, uh, solar, uh, hydropower, and so on and so forth, which uh, makes sense. Uh, but it's interesting to see as well for other uh, other sectors. So similar analysis for the real estate, where you see a clear, clear like a tilt towards the acquisition and ownership of building. Also a, a smaller list of activities that were reported. Um, but overall, it still makes a lot of sense in the context of this sector, right? Uh, renovation of existing buildings, construction of new buildings, and so on. What is interesting is then you start looking at other other uh, economic activities and in, for automobile, uh, you basically have a much lower amount of economic activities that companies can really uh, report on. Uh, and typically for the automobile uh, companies, there's only three and one is actually something that doesn't have a lot to do with automobile, but it's production and use of hydrogen. We had one mention of that in, in our disclosures. Overall, it's mainly manufacturing of low carbon technologies for transport. And another and last example is the chemical sector. So you have manufacture of plastics. Um, that was reported a few times, but then uh, clearly this sector is really not well covered by the, the, the EU taxonomy. And so you have companies that report on uh, acquisition and ownership of buildings or electricity generation for, from hydropower, which is interesting. Maybe it's part of their CAPEX or OPEX, uh, but basically it's a, it's a way to say that for those sectors, uh, the economic activities that will show alignment might not have a lot to do with their actually core uh, businesses. Uh, so now I will go into an illustrative case. So this is really just to kind of uh, bring the data further to, to life and think about a hypothetical portfolio and how we can use this type of data for analysis. Um, so first of all, on the concept of identification and prioritization of adverse impact, uh, we just took a very simple um, benchmark of the, the largest 300 um, European companies. Uh, I applied a very simple equal weighting, but what you can see on the left hand side is a bit of a traditional way to break down a portfolio by, by sector decomposition. Um, and what you can see on the middle of the slide is another way to look at it, uh, where I basically analyzed using CDP um, samples of materiality and notably high impact samples. And I looked at the number of companies who uh, basically had high impact for one of the themes, so uh, climate only, water only, forest only, or had a high impact for both climate uh, and forest or climate and water. And importantly, uh, the number of companies who had high impact on all three themes, and that's the 16% that you can see on the um, purple color. Uh, and finally, also companies that actually had a lower impact on all of those three themes, and that's 50% of my uh, hypothetical portfolio. 
Um, and so it's one way to look at it, of course. Uh, you could have done it in many different ways. So, for example, looking at uh, just one theme in particular, what my portfolio looks like in terms of what uh, impact level. We have that uh, at CDP where I could analyze uh, the percentage of my portfolio that have critical or very high impact, potential impact on, on water. And that's really the, the notion of uh, assessing potential risks. We haven't looked at what companies actually disclosed yet, but it's just giving a sort of illustration of, of how one could, could look at it in, in, this, uh, in this way. Um, so now, basically, um, I looked at uh, the, the some specific adverse impact indicators for this hypothetical portfolio. Uh, so on the left hand side, you can see the scope one um, emissions of uh, the companies in the portfolio that in total represent uh, one gigaton of emission. So this is not weighted. This is just the individual uh, companies. Um, and you had a very high coverage of uh, of this indicator for my hypothetical portfolio, where I had uh, yeah 292 companies that disclosed on on scope one. Uh, but what's important to note is that the first 30 companies really represent 90 percent of uh, the scope one emissions of my hypothetical uh, portfolio. Uh, now on the right hand side, so on the the sort of um, energy consumption uh, share that is one of the adverse impact indicators so on average my portfolio have 60 percent share of non-renewable uh, energy consumption into total energy consumption and one way to look at it is basically to think about uh, putting this number in context with the total energy consumption of of the companies so i ranked basically the companies per you know, energy consumption and looked at then their share of non-renewable energy consumption. And you can see that for a lot of those um, companies that consume a lot of uh, of um, energy, uh, their share of non-renewable energy consumption is often close to, to 100. There's one interesting example where one company has zero. So that means 100% of renewable energy consumption. And that's actually the London Stock Exchange that, you know, even if they seem to consume a lot of uh, energy, um, disclosed that they were sourcing all of this energy from uh, from renewable sources. Um, another way to, to look at this portfolio is uh, to look at the taxonomy data. Uh, so basically here again, I think it's an interesting thing to compare taxonomy disclosures with uh, other elements uh, that can help you put the taxonomy into context. So thinking about, uh, you know, my highest emitting companies in my portfolio. So here on the uh, left hand side of the chart, I kept the first 30 highest emitters and then I had a look at uh, what was their percentage of aligned revenue or aligned capex uh, and you can see basically interestingly that your your highest uh, emitter doesn't have any alignment for example or you can see that for some uh, fairly high emitters you you have uh, almost 80 percent of aligned capex which is a signal that the company is investing um, for its transition and on the the right hand side of the slide um, I'd like to to also think about it from a sectoral perspective. So just looking at power generation, which is obviously a big area of focus for the transition. Uh, and here again, you can think about the relationship between the emission of those companies and um, their alignment in terms of revenues. That is, you know, uh, more or less uh, uh, not low, but uh, let's say lower at least than their capex. And I think that's the, the key insight here is that you can see a very high level of capital expenditures that are aligned, which again uh, kind of point at the fact that those companies are investing a lot of their capital expenditures into, um, into the transition, probably into renewable uh, energy power generation. Finally, uh, and that's going to be the one of the last uh, maybe data insight slide of, of this presentation. Another way to look at it is, for example, to think about uh, companies that have impact across themes. Uh, so in my hypo hypothetical portfolio, I have approximately uh, yeah, 26 companies actually that have high impact uh, across themes uh, and answered 
to the three uh, CDP questionnaire. Um, and that represents uh, 46 megaton of CO2 uh, emissions uh, and uh, eight, 8 million megaliter of water consumed, which means 8 billion cubic meter of water consumed. And 22 out of those 26 companies are sourcing water from uh, areas of stress. And on the biodiversity side, you had uh, five companies that basically have activities near biodiversity sensitive areas that negatively affect it, but they implemented mitigation measure, but you also had 15 companies that didn't assess the potential impact or did not respond. So it's another way to look at prioritization and think about which companies might have, uh, you know, a high impact across different themes uh, and think about a more holistic vision of companies that can then, uh, you know, be used to prioritize and drive engagement which is an important element of what we do at CDP. And I like to give this one example of a, of a company um, in the infrastructure sector uh, that is one of the highest emitters at 11 uh, megaton of CO2, uh, consumes 140 million megawatts uh, of, of energy, 100% from non-renewables, but it's showing a 37th alignment of taxonomy revenue and 86% of capex alignment um, and yet uh, it still has impact that uh, span across the sims uh, for example 88 million cubic liter consumed and so there's this uh, kind of cross-sectoral element of this company's impact that it's showing sign of transitioning but also on other themes related to nature, maybe we need to look deeper into what the company is doing to address um, other elements that don't necessarily relate to climate change uh, mitigation. Um, and this is what uh, we did with this program I was referring to this, uh, this year, where we uh, basically partnered with investors to essentially think about how to engage with companies uh, on the disclosure of their adverse impacts. Uh, and there's, of course, engagement for disclosure, but then there's also engagement for impact. So how can we uh, talk to companies and see where they can reduce their, their highest, uh, let's say, sources of, uh, of impact? And this is where we see collective engagement through platforms like CDP can really complement individual engagement that investors are running with uh, companies in their, in their real portfolio. Um, so with this, I will hand uh, over to Jérôme, maybe, to give a brief overview uh, of, of the data set. Great. Thank you, Hélène, for this brilliant presentation. Uh, it's amazing to see uh, the data uh, visualized, uh, collected by CDP, so very well done. What I'm going to show now is just a very practical way for uh, you in the call to access the source data behind what Ellen showed. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and show you um, the CDP dashboard first that uh, I guess most of you are familiar with. Um, I guess you should all see my screen now. And uh, as you can see here, I've already logged in to the CDP investor dashboard. Um, remember that if you don't have a login, please contact us or contact your account manager. Uh, we've delivered uh, the data sets relative to the Green Finance Accelerator into a section uh, of the dashboard. Uh, you recognize the various section here relative to the extract of data, scores, uh, and you have a section here that is called additional CDP data set. And this is where, when I click on it, I can see the Green Finance Accelerator data set. So this data set is currently available only to the participants of the Green Finance Accelerator engagement program that Ellen described in her last slide. If you want to access this data set, please contact us. We are not closing the door, but we would just like to understand better and maybe give you uh, a little bit of background about the data set. Um, now, if I click on this data set, I've downloaded and I will then access this Excel um, that contains a disclaimer, that contains as well a guide uh, explaining the various tabs, the information, but also the various uh, principal adverse indicators, 
taxonomy data points. Um, so you can see that there, there is a data dictionary explaining each data point. And here I can open the data set. So that is pretty standard uh, with CDP. You have a list of companies, CDP account ID, you have primary IZ in and region sector. Now, um, what's interesting in this data set is that we have actually 15,000 uh, companies covered. So it's really the whole of CDP capital markets universe, meaning all the companies we ask to disclose in one of the theme. Um, if I then want to see the one which actually disclosed, I would have to filter by submission and remove, for example, all the company that did not submit to climate. So here, for example, if I want to see all the companies that have submitted, I would just select the three submitted, submit it non-publicly, meaning only you investor signatories can access it, submit it publicly, meaning the information is available publicly, and submit it publicly through the minimum version questionnaire, which is a reduced version of the CDP questionnaire. OK, so I could decide to do this or not, and obviously I will have more information. Um, another important information here is whether, and I think Ellen talked about it extensively, is the um, materiality of, of the theme. So uh, here we say whether the company has been requested on climate, water or forest. This is related to uh, a materiality analysis that we do, and this materiality analysis is publicly available. It's open source. So um, it's referenced in the guide, but feel free to ask us as well. Then you can see whether the company belongs to a high impact sample of CDP, um, which is an important sample we work with, or the water high impact uh, and the water impact level, whether it's critical or not, and the forest impact level. We also say whether it, it belongs to the ACQUI uh, MSCI index. Um, I already talked about the submission status uh, to climate, water and forest. And here I will then find uh, the information about the either taxonomy data or uh, principal adverse indicators. So it starts with some taxonomy data alignment at um, I would say at the, at the company level, um, and you will see some uh, basic percentages um, that would be uh, then necessary for, for you to assess. And then here I would find some principal adverse indicators first on G greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but also energy consumption from renewable sources. So all these are, uh, you see the purple line here, these are climate related principal ad adverse indicators. And then I switch to water principal adverse indicators. Um, as well as biodiversity principal adverse indicators. So that's it. I uh, advise you to have a look at this data set if you haven't. If you don't have access, feel free to contact us. Uh, you will see our contact details in the slide right after. And back to you, Len. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, so I think now we're just going to give a uh, ask uh, the participants to answer to a quick poll um just uh, it's part of um grant requirement we're funded by a grant from the eu uh from the european union so it's just to kind of test whether this uh, webinar was useful um to to um, improve knowledge or yeah whether um whether you learned anything basically uh, yeah, and while you answer this, maybe we can see if there are any questions. Um, I don't know if anyone oh. asks a question. We'll have a look. You can also share the last slides where there, there are contact details. Yes, absolutely, actually. I will share the contact details. It was a lot of information, so I'm <laughs> very happy to take uh, questions uh separately uh but yeah we will we will share the slides anyways with everyone who participated um the recording will be made available um and you can contact us for any follow-up questions whether it's uh, it's questions related to data points um or, or question regarding the access to, to cdp data <laughs>